welcome to uh, yet another lecture about the Institute of Advanced Studies for the people which are not from SDU. This is an initiative from uh, our university, uh, initiative of uh, Italian. We have uh, talks every week, not so to speak, and uh, the talks are divided into ideas and lectures. Ideas are from some young scientists uh, that have brilliant ideas. And lectures are from a senior scientist from a that uh, have already demonstrated the understanding and they give lectures to that. It's supposed to be like a documentary. So even if they're not from the field, you should kind of try to understand things, something like that, and have fun with them. It's like a live documentary, right? So uh, open and ask, why should I go? It's not my field. We spend a lot of time, uh, often it's being a researcher to to look for documentaries and things like that. Like now you have a possibility to watch one live and go special, so that should be fun. After this, there will be a little reception upstairs on figure two. So I will say now, and I will say also afterwards. So feel free to come upstairs. And just, just take the stairs up as soon as you can. And uh, you're going to come upstairs and uh, have the possibility to chat. Set our invitation to do it here, even, and this is uh, in the middle of our winter school in uh, theoretical physics. And Thomas, me, and Kevin, and Heidi are organizing. And this is actually fantastic. It's actually the first time we tried this uh, synergy. So, so I think that uh, we cover why you're here today. <laughs> and now, a few words about the <laughs> guru. I have no air since uh, a while. And uh, she had a PhD from uh, Hamburg and Daisy. And she has a position, if I can open my thing. I already know by heart, but very nice. Book. It's look very professional. Uh, then she has been positioned at Stanford, the Linear Accelerator, at Munich University, at CERN. And now is a professor at the Technical University of Dortmund. And as she just started her book, she's famous for polymer physics, and I'm sure that you will know a lot about that, yeah, which is a particular part of uh, high energy physics, but <coughs> contributing uh, a large and uh, for understanding fundamental interaction. So it's a pleasure to have uh, you know, discussing that for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here on this part of this lecture, and I hope I can tell you something about the excitement of my field, which is Labor physics. So let's start with something <coughs> that's not browsing. It's not doing that. Okay. I don't know. Maybe somebody can fix that. Uh, well, if, if I if fell asleep. Okay, very good. <coughs> no, thank you. Okay, so let's do. So I was asked to talk about <coughs> what I'm doing as a scientist. This is what I'm doing as a scientist. So this looks very familiar. These are three fruit. Three fruit. And from a scientific perspective, you can say, well, these are three objects that belong to the same kind. They are all three fruit, yet they are different. And they differ by all kinds of things that we can detect as a human. We don't even need a detector for this. So they have different colors. And they taste different. And the magic word here, of course, it obviously comes to your mind is they have different flavors. One is an apple, one is a pear, and one is a banana. So but this theme will be, of course, throughout this whole talk. And this is just an analogy with something that is very familiar to our everyday experience. There are things of the same kind. So we can even put them in the same basket. And then maybe say that well, it proper broader perspectives, maybe they are the same, they are all fruit. But of course we know the symmetry among the fruits is spoken by flavor. Okay. So this is one of the big themes in particle physics, that we study symmetries and symmetry breaking. And this was just a very bold, everyday um, experience example for illustrating this. Okay. So things have symmetries.
similar features, but yet at some level, this symmetry, which was very helpful to, to describe food, there's meat, there's pasta, and there are fruit, from this perspective, it's fantastic, it's perfectly okay to say these are the same thing. But of course, if you really want to eat them and you have some kind of flavors, you, you, you will notice that there's breaking of symmetry. And the other thing that's very important for particle physics is, of course, the strong desire for simplification. You want to describe nature with a minimal amount of degrees of freedom. We really want to go down to this microscopic level as much as we can. And this is, of course, this is a very old enterprise. This has been st started already by Aristoteles, who had a very uh, <laughs> simple proposal for a standard model of particle physics. At that time, he only had four, uh, five elements, water, <laughs> fire, earth, air, and ether. And this, of course, has been improved over the years. And a couple of hundred years ago, we started to develop the periodic table of elements, which at that time had only 60, uh, 66 elements, but by now it's, it's an enormous thing. It has more than 100 elements, and it is very useful for chemistry and for biology. But of course, as a, as a particle physicist, or even as an atomic physicist or a nuclear physicist, we would say, well, this is a useful collection of, uh, of elements, but we know already that at the microscopic level, the elements are not fundamental. Elements are atoms, and atoms are composed out of <coughs> nucleons, and nucleons are composed out of quarks and gluons, and even in the atoms there are also electrons. So the fundamental degrees of freedoms are not the elements in the periodic table. They started uh, with the onset of particle physics, where we discovered the electron, where the proton was discovered a little later, but now we know it's a nucleon. It's not fundamental anymore, but we have a muon, we have antiparticles, we have neutrinos, we have quarks, and, and all kinds of phenomena that come with it. So this is, I would say, these are the basic driving forces Jesus, in, uh, in particle physics that we we, we, we consider symmetries because they help us to organize the very few basic ingredients that we are after. Okay, so, so what can we do that again? And I try to not to stay too long on one, one table. Okay, so the standard model of particle physics. This is our periodic system with the <coughs> new ingredients that we consider as fundamental today. And as a very practical definition, I would say it's the most economical framework that describes data. Okay. And data, this is just a collection of data, so this is, you don't really have to read it, and there are longer and longer tables of stuff, so data really means that uh, there are observables, and then there are measurements, and then you can compare the measurement to the prediction in this standard model. The standard model is our fundament, is our theory of the degrees of freedom that we consider as elementary today. Okay, and this standard model, of course, has evolved over the past decades, and it has passed tremendous tests. It's taking at face value, experimentally uh, challenged, but not uh, ruled out. There's no hard evidence that it is wrong. Um, it's been tested at the LHC. So this is the, an experiment that takes place in the Geneva area. So this is a snapshot. And the experiments are underground. This ring here is the Large Hadron Collider. So protons are colliding head on at these, in these detectors. So there's one experiment, it's called CMS. There's one, it's called LHCB. That's the one that I will report <coughs> results from later on. There's Atlas and there's, there's Alice. So this whole <coughs> enterprise is underground. It's a multinational uh, enterprise and it's, it's running now. So we are very much interested in that. Yes, there's a question. What is the, why is the standard mon model economic? It's economical in the sense it has the least number of parameters. So we want to have a description of nature with the least, with a minimal input with the minimal 
input that we give in. You can describe, I would say, it's with this periodic table. The periodic table is an excellent description at a certain energy level for chemistry, and it's the right degrees of freedom. But for high energy physics or shortest distances, we want we have other degrees of freedom, and that's the level of sophistication we came up with. So it should be something simple. You want to have a fundamental theory that's not that doesn't have 10,000 degrees of freedom. Then you think, okay, so that by 10,000, I mean, there must be some symmetry among them. Okay. So that's the standard model, and it's been tested at the moment. And uh, let me remind you a little bit what it is. It's a quantum field theory and four dimensions. I mean, Minkowski space, three space, and one time dimension. And it has a local symmetry. All the interactions are based on local symmetry. So there's a strong interaction, SU3 color. There's the electroweak interaction. That's the product of its two, SU2 left, cross U1. Hypercharge. That's the basic symmetry of the standard model, and that's the symmetry that's responsible for the strong, the weak, and the electromagnetic interaction. And these interaction is between matter and matter are quarks and leptons, so they have spin one. And then there's also this famous Higgs particle that has been discovered in 2012, which is spinless. So if you write this down, everybody is massless. To get massless, you need spontaneous breaking of this electroweak symmetry, which is done, which is communicated by the Higgs particle to the standard model. So fields get their mass from coupling to the Higgs boson. Okay, so this is the standard model on <coughs> one page, and it's even, if you want to write it down as an equation, it's one line. This is what I want to, what I mean with it's really economical. Of course, this is a very abstract notation. So this F square term, uh, this, this is a term that tells you how the force carriers, the gauge bosons, the gluons, the proton, the Ws and the Z, how they, how they travel and how they interact with each other. And this term tells you, so psi is a fermion. And, and how fermions travel, so they have a kinetic term, but they also interact with the force carriers. And that's in this capital D, this is a covariant derivative, and there's a, there's a gauge field hidden in that. And there's a term, that's the kinetic term of the so phi, phi is the scale of the Higgs boson, and this term also gives masses, this one. To the, to the W bosons and the Z bosons, these are the massive bosons, the gate force carriers in the standard model. Okay. And this term is the one that gives mass, mass to fundamental fermions. This, one, this term is responsible in the standard model for the electron mass, for the top quark mass, for, for the masses of all the fermions in the standard model. And it is a coupling between two quarks or two leptons to the Higgs field, and the coupling space is in this, in this Y coupling. Okay, and we will come back later to this, because this is linked to this flavor physics topic. Okay, so this is the only link, in, if you wish, to the flavor topic. But it's one term in this one line equation, which is very, I mean, it's very condensed notation, but this is the fundamental equation of nature, of the standard model, of particle physics, and it, decri it describes really uh, many, many phenomena. Okay, so it's very, I think it is kind of economical. Okay, so this is where we are. So this is energy scale, it goes up, it's a logarithmic scale. <coughs> okay, and at some point you might draw, but you don't have to. But you can say, well, maybe this is nuclear physics, and maybe this is particle physics, but you can draw the line. I mean, you can move this line around, and it's, it's, it's more like at some point you start, okay, let's discuss about particle physics. So I, I kind of thought maybe it's the energy, <coughs> the binding energy of the deuteron of the QMED, which uh, it's maybe the answer for particle physics. And then there's the next scale, 
that's relevant to particle physics is the binding energy of the strong interaction, the scale of QCD. It's somewhere around a few hundred mega electron volts. Okay, and the next scale that we have seen in particle physics is the scale which has this <coughs> complicated name of electroweak symmetry breaking. It's the scale when the Higgs boson gives mass to fermions and the massive force carriers, the masses of the Z bosons and the W bosons, which is around 100 <coughs> giga electron volts. Okay, so these are inter the fundamental scales of particle physics that we have seen. And here I put the particles with their names uh, where they are roughly their masses. So the lightest particle here is the electron, uh, which is sub MeV mass. And then there's the first generation of quarks, the up and the down quarks. And a little bit heavier is the second generation, the muon and the strange quark. A little bit heavier, the tau lepton, the charm quark, the B quark, and the top quark. That's the, that's the heaviest fundamental particle that we have seen to date, that we, we consider this as fundamental as of today. I, I, I recall this is an experimental question whether we consider a particle as fundamental. Some time ago the proton was considered as fundamental, but now we know it's composed out of quarks and gluons. So according to current state of the art, these particles here are uh, consistent with the assumption of being fundamental. The heaviest of these particles is the top quark, 175 giga electron volt. And I also am putting here the masses of these uh, electroweak gauge bosons, the Ws and the Z. They are a little bit lighter. And then we have the Higgs boson here. It's 125 giga electron volt. And if you wish, this is the home of the standard model because this is where we have done many, many experiments and we have developed this standard model and it's consistent with data. And this shaded area here is the region that we want to, the territory that we want to explore with high energy experiments and more precise searches with precision experiments. So this is, this is the area of the unknown and if you, if you are using this uncertainty principle, I mean the Heisenberg's uh, relation, then you can link energy to time or link energy to, to distance. And if you want to have it in meters, this is as small <coughs> as 10 to the minus 18 meters and even smaller. This is, these are the distances that correspond to the energy scales that we are exploring at the LHC. This is the TeV scale, the Terra electron volt scale. Okay, so this is what we want to test. And of course we want to test the standard model because although we are very happy about it and it's very good, it has a couple of deficiencies and I'm just giving here a list. Okay, so there's the issue how to accommodate dark matter. Baryon asymmetry of the universe cannot be explained with the standard model. Uh, we have free gauge couplings. Is there a relation between them? We have the coupling of the strong, the weak, and the electromagnetic coupling constant. Uh, there's no gravity included. And the topic I want to allude here further in this talk is this flavor puzzle. So the flavor puzzle can be seen already here. There's the top quark, and there's the up quark. And from a symmetry perspective, they are both the very same thing. They are both fruit. But apparently, they are in very different places in this plot. Their masses are, are, are split by five orders of magnitude. So apparently, it's, it's not the same fruit. There must be something different. So what is it that makes these two fruits so different? That's the flavor puzzle. OK. Oops. OK. So but as a, as a to sum up, the standard model is a, is a really wonderful creation, and, uh, but it has to face these questions. And because these questions are beyond the standard model, we are looking for physics beyond the standard model. This is why we are improving experimental precision and try to reach into higher energies to test the standard model because given all these facts, it seems that it has to break down at some point. 
So, but coming back to these, uh, a little bit to, to flavor, so I'm reminding you here of this fundamental one line equation of our <coughs> description of nature. And let's just reconsider how economical it really is. So we have three forces, the strong, the weak, and the electromagnetic. So let's just count the number of parameters that we have in our theory. So how many parameters do we have to measure to describe everything? Okay. So we have three gauge couplings to measure, to be measured. Um, something sets the electroweak scale. That's, for instance, the mass of the Z boson. That's one parameter. And you have to know something about the scalar potential. It's just five parameters. It's really cool for <coughs> fundamental theory. But then all hell breaks loose in the fermion sector. And that's related to this term that we talked about earlier. That's the term that gives masses to fermions by coupling to the Higgs. 13 new parameters are coming in. So this looks not so nice as the other sectors. So we come up with in total 18 parameters. And this is still kind of minimal counting. So I was ignoring neutrino masses. We know that neutrinos are massive. but. We don't know exactly from which mechanism they get their mass, so I left it out here. <laughs> okay. So it seems that the flavor sector is, is the least economic sector of the whole standard model. And maybe this is where we think there is room for improvement. So if you have many parameters, you think maybe these are not the right degrees of freedom and maybe they are just the same, but we just have to figure out what tells a banana from an apple. Okay. So this is where we are with flavor. And so how comes flavor in? OK, so we have here fermion fields, for instance, quark two quarks that couple to a Higgs boson. But quarks, like leptons, they come in generations. We have a generational structure observed in nature, and that's part of the standard model. We have first, second, and third generation. So all of these psi fields that we have in this one line equation, they get an index, and the index goes from one to three, counting first, second, and third generation. And we label them usually according to their mass ordering. So the first generation is the lightest, and the second is a little heavier, and the third is the heaviest. For instance, the up quark is the lightest, it's first generation, charm quark is second, and third generation is the top quark. Okay. And this seems to be not doing a lot, but actually it gives rise to an enormous onset of phenomena. And this arises because this coupling here, if these fields here, psi, are vectors in generation space because they carry a generational index, it means that this object here, this coupling y, is a matrix now. And it doesn't have to be diagonal. It can have off-diagonal entries. And that means fermion generations, they can mix. They mix and change flavor. This is actually what they do. And they do this in weak processes and only in weak processes. This is not happening in just QCD, strong interaction. You need the weak interaction for particles to change flavor. And there is this phenomenon of CP violation related to this very matrix. So shown here are, again, first, second, and third generation, just the up-type quarks, up, charm, and top, and the down-type quarks, down, strange, bottom. And if you have a, a weak boson, it carries electric charge. So if the top quark emits a weak boson, then <coughs> it can decay into this weak boson and a weak quark. This is within the same generation, but it can also decay into a strange quark. And it can also decay into a down quark. So all of a sudden, we have these intergenerational transitions happening. And the relative strengths, I mean, how often does a top quark decay to a B quark versus how often does it decay to a top quark? You can read out from this Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa matrix, the CKM matrix. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hierarchical matrix. So, so on the diagonal. Uh, is roughly one, so decays within the same generations are preferred, and then you go further away. So lambda is a small parameter, so the larger the power of lambda, the further suppressor is. 
So the coupling from top to bottom is here, this is one, the coupling from top to strange is lambda squared, and top to down is lambda cubed, roughly. So there's a hierarchy, there's a very strong hierarchy in this mixing. And I'm just giving you here the hierarchies, but this matrix is mapped. It's measured, and some of its entries are measured with extremely high precision, below 1%. Some are a little less measured. This is an active program at the <coughs> LHCB experiment to measure, to understand this mixing better and better, because the better you understand parameters within the standard model, the better you can test or look for deviations from the standard model. So but what is it with the fruit and the flavors? So now we have three generations. And these are apparently very different objects because they have different mass. Okay, But they are coupling to the gauge interactions. So the strong, the weak, and the electromagnetic one are exactly identical. So there is a symmetry. For the gauge interactions, um, for the gauge interactions, press one once more. Okay, so for the gauge interactions, they are the same. The gauge interactions don't care about which generation they are coupling to. However, we know that, okay, but these things are not the same because they have different mass. Okay, so this is the flavor. Flavor, what flavor does to your model. It's not working. Maybe. No? Okay, very good. So this is again the plot from before. We have this quark, we have the spectrum. <laughs> Up, down, strange, charm, bottom, top quarks. So here you have the masses. Uh, you can actually see the up quark mass has two, is around three MeV, and the top quark mass is much, much heavier. There's five orders of magnitude, although they are exactly the same for the gauge interactions, for the fundamental forces. Okay. And uh, so one can even include mixing. So all the flavor, all the, dif the distinction between the different box is encoded in the standard model in this Y matrix. And you can, this is a little bit sim simplifying, so there's a Y matrix for uptype quarks, and there's a Y matrix for downtype quarks, and there's a Y matrix for leptons. And I'm, so these are fundamental <coughs> parameters, and I, I, I wrote them here as determined by experiment. So this is the uptype quark Y matrix. And just look at it. So there's an entry that's almost one. This is the one that's responsible for the mass of the top quark. Actually, its, it's coupling to the Higgs is roughly one. This is a very natural number if you have a dimensionless coupling that this. Its size is around one. But all the other entries are, are, are smaller. OK, so there's two orders of magnitude smaller. This is roughly the charm quark. Um, but we have very strong hierarchies. We have numbers as small as 10 to the minus 8. And we have uh, imaginary parts. These are the ones that are responsible for CP violation. OK, we have different signs. OK, and we have also the masses for the down quarks. They are encoded in this Y down matrix. And it's very hierarchical. <coughs> so this is first, second, third generation for the charged mm. leptons. First, second, charged generation. So if you look at these numbers, <coughs> I mean, do you think these numbers are just random? Or is there a structure? So if you think there is a structure, you would think, OK, let's find out what structures these numbers. What is the mechanism that makes them so hierarchical? <coughs> I mean, if you have three things of the same kind, of roughly the same kind, you would think maybe the mass should be similar. I mean, just go back to our food example. So the weight of a banana and an apple and a, and a pear, they are roughly the same. Okay, But this is not so for the crops. <coughs> for the quarks or for the fermions, each of them 
they have exactly the same couplings to the interaction, but the mass is very different. <coughs> okay? So there's a strong hierarchy. It's, I mean, to me, this doesn't look like, I mean, it looks too much structure to be an accident, but this is my opinion. You can still say, well, I mean, this is how nature made them. Okay, but for people thinking about flavor, this is a serious puzzle. Why these numbers look the way they are? These numbers are measured. They are not predicted in the standard model. They are parameters of the standard model. So within the standard model, we all find, we measure them, and then we can make predictions. But we haven't <coughs> understood, actually, what makes these numbers look, look this way. And this is a very deep problem. This is the flavor problem. And I have no answer to this. There are proposals explaining these hierarchies. And I will also come back to this and tell you how to can maybe check these proposals. But there is no I mean, agreed answer from the whole community to the mechanism that produces these numbers. Okay. But still what you can do, since this is all measured and the standard model is very predictive, you can actually go on and test the standard model. Now we know its input. No. <laughs> oh, good. It's still going. Very good. Okay, and we test the standard model. With, uh, with its feature. And it has a feature that's called universality. And universality is exactly that fermions are all proved. Namely, they all, irrespective of the first, second, and third generation, they have the same couplings to the gauge bosons, to the, to the interactions. Okay? They, dis they differ in mass, but they have the same interaction. So, now we do this not with quarks, we do this with leptons, and this is apparently what comes out of what's useful experimentally. So now we have our the electron, the muon, and the tau as our flavors, as our lepton flavors. And the standard model predicts their couple identical, exactly identical in the same way to gauge bosons. Now uh, there are two interesting <coughs> anomalies that exist since 2014, and they are driven by this LHCb experiment, but also previous experiments, uh, so-called B-factories have worked on this. And I want you to learn a little bit about these anomalies because I, I find them very fascinating. And uh, of course, these are anomalies. Uh, this, this observable RK has measured with some significance of 2.6 sigma away from the standard model. 2.6 sigma is not much, okay? But it can easily be statistical and go away. But if it stays, it has enormous implications. So if you are a theorist working on this field, you should start, you shouldn't be waiting for 10 sigma. Okay, so I want to talk about a little bit about this anomaly and RK is a ratio of branching ratios. There's a B-meson, it's a bound state of a B-quark, that decays to a bound state of a kaon, that's a bound state of a strange quark, and muons. And you divide this rate, this branching ratio to the same thing, but instead of muons, you are measuring electrons. So if muons and electrons would be the same under the gauge interactions, this ratio would be one. So LHCb hasn't measured one. So this anomaly looks for differences between muons this observable looks for differences between muons and electrons. There's another one, it's RD or RD star, depending on the, whether this D meson here, it's a bound state of charm quarks, is a vector <coughs> or is a pseudoscalar. And it compares tau leptons to all the other two, the lighter two generations, the electron and the, and the muon. And uh, for the vector, it's a 3.4 sigma, and for the D, it's 2.1 sigma. So apparently there's something in the data that's not perfectly consistent with the standard model um, that we observe in quark, de in meson decays, in quark processes into electronic final states. So we are probing one of the hardwired concepts of the standard model, whether leptons are actually coupling universally. So let me talk a little bit about RK. So RK, so LNU, lepton non-universality, you can define this even more generally. The k is just 
uh, that you can use for, but you can also use a K star or an inclusive final state. And all models which couple universally to leptons, so for which these leptons are all good, including the standard model, this ratio is one. And this is to show you a little bit what particle physics actually the status. This is the branching ratio for B2K into muons, <coughs> as measured by LHCB, the experiment at CERN, one of those. And it's a branching ratio at the level of 10 to the minus 7. So we are measuring the processes. If you have, I mean, you need 10 to the 7 reconstructed <coughs> B-measurements to, to have one on average decay into this mode. So to have statistics here even on the uncertainty, you, you can imagine how many, what, what event rates you need. Okay, so this is the measurement of LHCB and you can compare it to the standard model prediction. It's also, it's the right order of magnitude and it agrees, although the standard model is a little bit higher, but you notice immediately the uncertainty of, this, of the theory calculation is way bigger than what the experiment has measured. And this is the evil thing that comes up once you do physics with quarks, it's bound state. Quarks are not decaying, I mean, in the lab, they are decaying within this hydronic <coughs> medium. They're decaying in these female ones. Okay. If somebody to blame, are these people here in the lab? This is, uh, this is <laughs> where you should, you should be working on if you are, if you are in, lattice, in lattice field theory. So these are form factor uncertainties for the experts. Okay. So they are much bigger than what the experiment can do. So if you're just comparing these two numbers, you wouldn't be thinking about new physics or a viral, I mean, breakdown of the standard model because of these large uncertainties. Now you can go to the B2K EE mode. LHCB has measured it as well. And the uncertainties are a bit larger because electrons are more difficult for them. The standard model prediction is the same because the standard model couples universally two leptons. And, uh, but again, just comparing these two numbers, you wouldn't be able to claim any BSM, any physics beyond the standard model. Now you can do the ratio, and this is what LHCB finds. So it's something like three quarters plus minus 10%. It's below one. So the nice thing is here, we, are, can, we can use this symmetry of the standard model, the universality, to write here a one, and it's not a one with uncertainties like this. And this is just, of course, in the both numerator and denominator, there are large uncertainties. But they have to cancel exactly because the standard model is coupled universally to, to the leptons. So now with this ratio, we are able to say something because we can get rid of these nasty uncertainties. So this is the experimental situa situation. This is our K, this is one. This is the standard model in pink, and in blue, and in red are previous measurements of RK. So RK is, is, is measured in some kinematic <coughs> distribution. It's the invariant mass of this dilepton pair. And this tiny thing here in black, this is the LHCB result. So it's, it's, it's 2.6 sigma below the standard model. And this creates a lot of uh, excitement. So, question. yes. What is the, the red cross to the upper right? The red cross, <coughs> that's a measurement by Barbar. It's a previous experiment. And, and you see, it's consistent with the standard model at, at one sigma. So all previous experiments, like the blue one, this is Bell. This is an experiment in Japan. And the, the red one, this is an experiment that was running at Stanford. Um, they didn't have the sensitivity. Uh, their uncertainties are much larger than what LHCB <coughs> is doing, and their results were consistent with the standard model. So they did measurements, but they didn't have enough events. So they, they couldn't, they could prove that one can measure this, but they couldn't they didn't see any deviation. So the new thing here is this black cross, and this is LHCB. Okay, so it's clear that also LHCB could in principle measure this for, for higher values of Q squared. This would be a very nice consistency check. Okay. So, so, so having this, we would like to 
explain this? Okay, if you're in phenomenology, you, you immediately think about how can we explain 25% deviation from the standard model in this ratio? Is this even possible given that we probe the standard model with such high level of scrutiny? Okay, so if you do, if you are doing all the math, you figure out that there's this decay amplitude from a big quark to a strange quark and two leptons in the standard model. And to get this effect, this suppression of RK, you need 25% correction on top of the standard model amplitude. So the standard model is really well tested. So how can you do this? And the trick is that this type of this process here from a B quark to a strange quark, this can be mediated only through a quantum effect to one of these loop processes. Okay, so you need the weak interaction to change flavor, but you need two inter, you need to do this twice. You need to change from a B quark, for instance, to a top quark, and then from a top quark to a strange quark. So it's at higher order in the weak interaction. In the standard model, this is why it's only 10 to the minus 7 branching ratio. Okay, so in the easiest idea to get a large effect on something that's, that's a quantum effect, that's a loop process, is to add something that ha is happening at tree level. And the most direct model that you can write down in this situation is a model with so-called leptoquarks. So leptoquarks are hypothetical objects. They are not <coughs> existing in the standard model and they, they couple quarks to leptons. So this is a quark, this is a lepton, this phi is a leptoquark, and it has a coupling matrix. <coughs> so this is then the Feynman diagram for this. So there's a B quark, and it decays into a lepton, and there's a coupling here. It says B quark and lepton. This leptoquark phi is exchanged. It has a mass M, okay, and then it decays to the lepton, and a strange quark and it has the coupling strange and left. So there's always this generational index in this coupling. And if you do this, actually, you can do lots of things. Uh, well, it actually works. You can explain RK with these type of models. And it's very predictive. You get a mass range from 1 to 50 TeV. So if the mass is 1 TeV, it would be really nice if it's around 1 TV. You can look for this particle that's an explanation of this anomaly at Atlas or CMS at the other experiments at the LHC. And you can, for instance, look for these particles through their decays. Now, that's where things become model dependent. It depends what are the interactions of this leptoquark. If it is a vector under the weak interaction, then these type of decays can happen. If it is a, a triplet under this SU2 left gauge group, there are other modes that can happen. And you see here, top, top particles are in the final state, so they're totally different signatures. So directly, you can, you can actually check this. But one way to actually check this, and I, I'm really hoping that this will be uh, uh, announced soon, is to measure something else. Okay. So we want to distinguish models that explain our case. So now we see an anomaly and we have several explanations. We can have SU2 vectors or we can have SU2 triplets, scalars of these hypothetical leptoquarks. And we want to know, okay, we want to pin this down. So the best thing to do is to measure besides RK the same thing but with a vector in the final state. Now this is, you would think this is, this is the same, it's both B to S. But the, there's, this, there's a difference because uh, they, it's a different spin structure. This is a pseudoscalar and this is a vector. And that means left-handed and right-handed couplings are treated differently in this decay mode. And this is exactly what these two different explanations do. They come with different weights of left-handed and right-handed couplings, okay? So that means you can draw a correlation. So this is RK, this is one, this is the standard model, and in green we have this one sigma band of the measurement of this anomaly, 
Okay, and here on the y-axis we have a ratio of RK star, which is not measured yet, and RK. So this is a theory curve. So at 1, 1, we have the standard model. RK star is also 1 in the standard model. Okay, and uh, in, in red, this is the prediction if these hypothetical particles are SU2 triplets, and in blue, is a curve, it's a prediction if these hypothetical particles um, are, are a doublet under SU2. So red and blue can both explain RK. You can see this because they overlap with this green band. Okay, But they predict a different value of RK star. And I'm showing you this plot, which is really front end science in this field, because LHCB is uh, working on an analysis on RK star. So the first the important thing is RK star can be different than RK and it can substantiate this anomaly. It will not be able to rule out this anomaly because uh, with these different couplings it is possible that RK over RK star is not one. It can be different. But this is really close by what is coming out uh, of the uh, experimental uh, secret corners. So I'm not a member of LHCB, but this has been rumored that they, they are working on this and, and it's probably coming out at some point. Uh, sorry, can I ask a question? I mean, how high did this case have to be around the pair from the, uh, this scale, the, the lab book works? What is the uh, energy scale? Uh, Oh, it's, 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 it's above the search limit, something like 1 TeV, <laughs> and it doesn't decouple. So they, they cannot be much heavier than 50 TeV, which is, of course, which is beyond what we can do at the LHC, but it is not beyond what people are thinking about future colliders. So, so, so when you look at this Feynman diagram, and you would be calculating this diagram, you would say the impact and low energies is the product of these two couplings divided by the mass squared of this particle. So the anomaly sets you the size of this product divided by the mass squared. So you can make the effect big by making the mass light or by having the couplings large or, the, or vice versa. But you need m more information to resolve this ambiguity and this comes from, from meson mixing. So actually it doesn't decouple. So if you, if you say RK, this is a signal, it doesn't, it doesn't decouple. So how much time do I have? You have uh, five minutes, so because it will be typical 10 minutes discussion. Yes, very good. Okay, so we are in the middle of beyond the standard model physics. We are in this flavor discussion, and this is an, an, this is an anomaly in the data, and it's linked to flavor. It, it is linked to, to, to a very... Uh, very strong piece of the standard model that's universality. Fermions couple university to, universally to the gauge interactions and apparently this anomaly tells you if this is true, it tells you they are not. And if they are not, it is, it rules, it's a breakdown of the standard model. It has very strong implications. So this is why we are very excited about this uh, this first measurement from LHCB, and of course this needs uh, this needs uh, verification with more statistics. Okay, so you can explain this with these type of leptoquarks, and uh, uh, so there are different types. There are the doublets and there are tr the triplets. They have different decay modes. You could look for them at colliders, and also LHCB can distinguish these models, these two proposals, to explain this anomaly. Okay, so what, what is the link with flavor? Of course, flavor is still, we haven't answered this question. If this is true, and we explain this with these hypothetical new particles, these leptoquarks, why do they couple different to muons than to electrons? We still have to break this symmetry. And now the symmetry breaking, which can't be coming from the standard model, has to be just moved to this new particle. So that means we have to say something about flavor 
the flavor of these little pots. Mm. And this is where things get really interesting. I mean, there's one thing to test the standard model, but it's, it's a much bigger step to maybe approach a little bit towards this enormous problem that we don't know why the quark masses are the way they are, this flavor part. Okay. So again, this is this Feynman diagram, and this is here, we have these, these couplings, and they are labeled according to the flavors of the particles they couple to. Okay, and we can write this in terms of a matrix. And this is really the beauty of this particular standard model extension. It's a particle that couples quarks <coughs> to leptons. That means that this coupling matrix has information about quark flavor in the, in the rows. So it couples in the first generation, it couples in the, in the first row, it couples to the first generation quarks. In the second row, it couples to second generation quarks. Third row to third generation. Okay, but in the columns, we have the couplings to the different lepton generations. So if you want to explain R K, uh, and you say, okay, all the all the anomalies are in the muons, you need the product of these two couplings. So it's a B quark to a muon and an S quark to a muon. If you say no, R K comes because the Denominator is non-standard, so when you need a coupling from an electron to the strange quark and an electron to the B quark. But in principle, this whole matrix is filled, and you need a theory of flavor to fill this. But once you have now, assuming that this, is, this anomaly actually is true, there is a signal, you can actually probe this matrix. That means you can probe something that links lepton and quark flavor. This we don't have in the standard model. So this is the opportunity in this model. Okay, so again, the columns here. This is lepton flavor. Okay, and the rows is quark flavor. Now, we do have theories of flavor. We do have models that say, why are the leptons the way they are? It's just that they are, there's more than one model and it is difficult to rule one model out. Within the standard model, we can't do this. We need more models. There are many models that accommodate the mass masses that we measure for the leptons and for the quarks. Okay. So for the leptons, usually uh, there's also a mixing matrix, and it's, it's not hierarchical. It has order one entries, and that has stimulated scientists to explain the symmetry, to explain lepton masses and mixing with discrete symmetries. They are subgroups of SU3. Okay? So this is what we do for the columns of this matrix. We use discrete flavor symmetries. For instance, A4, which is the, the group of the tetrahedra. Okay, and it's it's a subgroup of SU3 because of three generations. And what this mechanism predicts, it fills this matrix essentially with zeros and ones. That's the feature of this discrete group. That correctly can reproduce uh, <coughs> the mixing that we see in the neutrino sector. So for the rows, we know everything is hierarchical. We talked about this, the quark masses and the mixing, the CKM mixing matrix. So we use something else. So this is really something, a feature that's different between quarks and leptons. We, we use, this is called a so-called Prokat nielsen symmetry, it's a U1 symmetry, and it creates hierarchies. So we need hierarchies among the rows. This, you need these models to explain flavor in the standard model, but the nice thing is now, we can predict now with these, these leptocore couplings. So it's very easy with these theoretical tools to come up with a matrix like this. So this matrix essentially does exactly what you want. Uh, it couples B quarks to muons, and it couples strange quarks to muons, and the coupling to the strange quarks is a little bit suppressed, but uh, this is because the strange quark mass is lower than the B quark mass. Okay. So within left of quarks, you can actually probe flavor symmetries with these anomaly. So this is really an opportunity. So I don't know whether this anomaly will stay. If it goes away, then okay. If it stays, 
it really opens the window because it's not just we are testing the standard model and the standard model broke down already. This is a super, super big thing. We can learn something about flavor because we are having, we are seeing breakdown of lepton lumi universality in quark meson decay. So we have the opportunity to see some connections between these two different sectors, leptons and quarks. Okay. So this is one example where the road can go. There's this anomaly and there are other explanations. But this shows that if we actually see new physics, there's more than just that the standard model broke down. We can learn something about very deep problems like the flavor problem. You know quarks are all food and leptons are all food and that's a symmetry because for the gauge interactions they are all the same. But of course they are not the same and their features are very different and we don't know why. But with this type of anomalies, we can for instance test whether this ansatz with an A4 and a fogart nielsen symmetry is consistent with data. And we are able to rule out flavor models. Okay. And with these words, um, I'm happy to stop and take your, take your questions. hesitating because I'm not sure if this paper where G minus 2 has been addressed uh, has not received some criticism. You know, there are different types of leptoquarks. You can write them in different representations under the standard model group. And some have been challenged by other experiments. But people have looked into this and I can point to the literature. You want. But I, 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 I'm aware that there have been some kind of, okay, so people sometimes have overlooked some constraints, and it may be that this was one of the papers. You can make a connection. You can also try to link these two anomalies that we've seen. Other questions? Yeah. 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 Is there a dark matter candidate in the leptoquark field? Uh, usually not, because the leptoquark is colored. So I think there can be, it's, it's, not, a, it's, it, it's not a strict no, but it requires work to have a colored particle dark matter if this at all can be done. But people have linked uh, uh, anomalies. Uh, they have thought about Higgs to tau mu <coughs> and, and, and R cables, R D star. They have linked it with neutrino masses. Of, <laughs> are, are the hierarchies in the lepton sector and the quark sector, are they connected in some way uh, through the lepton quark? Uh, well, the lepton quark is just, just a particle, but they, there's a link. Yes, they are linked. They are linked, so you can think about three terms. Quark masses, lepton masses, and this lepton quark coupling. And these, all these terms, they, are, they involve two fermion fields. You can have two quark fields, two lepton fields, and you have one term with quark and leptons. And once you fix the quantum numbers of the <laughs> leptons and the quarks, everything is determined. So there's a relation between all these three terms, and this is what I wanted to say. Because once you specify these charges, you can fix them by requiring that quark masses and lepton masses are fixed. You have a prediction for the lepton-quark coupling, and then you can see whether it explains anomalies. So there's a relation. This is exactly what's so hot about lepton-quarks. Was that the first place for phase two to attend these these the actual parameters? They will do it. The anomaly is real. The we significant sector can be measured. Oh, that I, I, I don't know, but uh, they will be performing at least as good as LHCB. LHCB has, will be having at the end of run two higher signal rates.
Super well too, it will take some time, but they are better with the electrons. So LHCB is much, is, is, they have about a factor of five more muon events than electron events. So on RK, the uncertainty is dominated by the uncertainty in the electron modes. So well is, is, will take some time to keep up with the muon statistics of LHCB, but they will be better with electrons. So if you wish, they can, you can just measure the branching ratio for EE for the electrons at day two, and then combine. But they will never get beyond five sigma. That they can do, yes. Can. Okay. Yes, yes. They can do this, but there will be there are other <coughs> measurements. It's not just RK. For instance, uh, LHCB has <coughs> only measured RK in this kinematic region of small Q squared. They can also measure it at the, at the high Q squared. There's a roughly the same event rates. I mean, it's a little lower, but it's kind of the same ballpark. But it's more difficult for LHCB because the electrons they radiate, and then they have to see that the events are in the right in the right bin and not move out of the bin and migration into this bin. But this radiation is not as problematic as day two. So yeah, they are also looking into measuring these electron, these mu to e ratios in other final stage, as I said in k stars, which is rumored to be coming out soon, which will be a very interesting number to know. But uh, as I said, it, it, even if, if, if RK and RK star are not the same, it would suggest that there's beyond the standard model physics which has ranking occurrence. So it would be, I would so say, it would be sociologically stressful if RK star turned out to be one. But it's in a, <coughs> in a model independent way, you would say, okay, it, it means that we need PSM physics with right hand occurrence. So I think that the closest thing here is, is RK in all bins, better updates in all bins, RK star. Uh, they can also do R phi. Everything that does D to S in dielectrons. The other asymmetry I didn't have, didn't talk much about this. This is the this is Amazons. That's an anomaly between tau leptons and others, and it's induced in the standard model at three level. So to have a large BSM effect on something that's already large in the standard model, this requires really really large new physics. So that I think needs to get more into thermal equilibrium, but of course this also will be pursued at day two. Day two will be very important for this. So this the, the, the electrocore model, what is the dependence on Q squared of RK? Oh, it's, uh, for RK it's roughly the same. It's not, it's not a big, it's not a big difference. I mean, in the standard model it's, it's one. And uh, because in these leptocorp models, what you are inducing are these four fermion operators. <laughs> operators with a weak quark, a strange quark, and two muons. And they are dominating. They are dominating except at very small Q squared where there is a dipole contribution which goes like one over Q squared. Okay, but that's, that's as when you move out to higher Q squared, that one becomes less and less relevant. So, rough, so roughly to first order, it's the same with PSM. Any further questions? I, I just, yeah, please. Uh, just a question about, uh, do you know what is the time scale when, when you will have the answer for the air car, air car star coming from the LHC? Or from LHCB, okay, so there's a Morion conference coming up. This is one of the bigger spring conferences. And okay, so that's, it could be that RK star is presented the first church, but this will not decide this. This will just add another part. When they update RK, I don't know. Bay 2 is starting 2007, this year, next year, and then it is, okay, so they start running and they have to accumulate enough data as we saw. The, Branching ratios tend to the minus seven. They need a lot of events to have that reconstructed. I mean, because there's a lot of my events that they don't, there's more bees than they can actually analyze. So it will take a few years. It will take a few years from now. And could you comment on how comparable are the different uh, places where you can do experiments? 
like the Bell and Baba and LHC, is it, can you compare the results or do you know that, that the, there are some things in the experiments that are different and that might lead to some bias in the results you get? Or okay, so Bell and Baba are not running anymore. These experiments, they have been shut down uh, some time ago and whenever there's new data, they just reanalyze new data. But they were actually limit, they are limited by statistics. They are really trying the best they can, but ultimately LHCB has passed LHCB has passed them already in terms of statistics. So they are adding something to this picture in terms of consistency, but they are they're not they cannot dominate the situation anymore. So there was Bell and Babar and now there is Bell 2 at the horizon. So Bell 2 will will start. So Bell 2 is an experiment with an E plus E minus collider. And that is what people call a clean environment. You know, the LHC collides protons, so protons collide, and there's a lot of stuff. I mean, there are ions produced, and pi zeros, and they decay, so there are photons from all, all, all over the place. And now we have uh, B2K EV and electrons, they also <coughs> radiate. So the LHCB is a, is a more complicated environment, but of course, they have high event rates, and they are producing really, really, they have high luminosity, they have really large number of, of peak quarks. So for them, the electron modes require more simulation than the muon modes. So this is something that is discussed. Um, in their paper, they explain how they check their results. So there's a decay that's very frequent the beam is on decays to a J side, and decay in the J side, it's a resonance, decays also mu nu and E. Mu. And that has been, that's a branching ratio of 10 to the minus 3. So there they have lots of events. So on resonance, they checked that the ratio was 1. So this was their test that this, their, their reconstruction of electrons is correct. But then it's an extrapolation because they are not at 10 to the minus 3 rates and they are, it's, it's a different kinematical point. Okay, so this is, this is what they did. So it's, it's, the first me it's the first measurement with electrons at the LH, at, in the LHCB experiment. <coughs> so, so they were pushing really hard and I think it's a very interesting number, but it's, uh, I mean, it needs validation. And it will, LHCB will work on this. And, and I think because this number is so important, it needs any way it needs an independent check. So there's LHCB and Bell 2 for this anomaly. Sir, I think the food is ready. And you can ask for the questions upstairs. Let's thank again. Uh, Thank you very much.